Okay, it's 12.33, so I'm gonna get started. Hello, everyone. This is the second lecture of the spring 2021 Ronald Jeanette Gaddy Lecture Series. My name is Kara, and I'm gonna be one of your co-hosts today. I'm joined by Anna Kristieva, which is our other wonderful co-host who has a much more beautiful background than I do. <laughs> She's much more uh, Zoom savvy than I am. But I am a second year master's of public administration student here at Cornell, and I'm studying the intersection of science, technology, and infrastructure policy when it comes to environmental conservation and infrastructure development with communities, which I think is very prevalent in Southeast Asia, especially in my area of interest, which is Cambodia. And so how this lecture series works is we're going to have wonderful Cherry present for 45 minutes. We're gonna ask that you uh, silence your microphone so that there's no interruptions. And we're gonna have the chat open for your questions. So if you have any questions, we're gonna address it at the end about a 20 or 30 minute uh, question and answer period. We ask that you put your questions in the chat so we can keep track of the questions coming in in order so we can get to everyone's question in order and also make sure we can address as many as we can within the question and answer period. But also we're going to invite you to ask your question live if you so choose to do so, so that we can have an interactive experience with everyone. And we understand it's not the most interactive with Zoom and we're probably all very Zoom tired, but we're gonna to try to emulate the original Gaddy series as much as we can, even though we can't be in the Kane Center. So with that, I'm going to give uh, Cherry's official bio for everyone to hear and then we're gonna to go to the presentation. So Cherubim Kizan studies the knowledge systems and social formations interrelated with the textiles and dress of the Bogobo, one of several indigenous peoples of the Davao region in Southern Mindanao. She has published widely on US colonial era museum collections of Bogobo textiles, examined through the lens of contemporary fieldwork in the origin community with comparative research into related traditions among the Tmoli, Balan, and Mandaya. She is collaborating on a praxis-based assessment of a landmark law governing indigenous people in the Philippines. She continues to be interested in the complexity of indigenous semantic categories of cloth and dress, and recently published on the challenges of translation and video in representing the weaver's voice in visual anthropology review. She is currently on a year-long sabbatical from her post as associate professor of anthropology at Seton Hall University, and is now a visiting fellow for spring 2021 at Bar Graduate Center. And with that, Cherry, I turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kara. Uh, let me first uh, share my screen and um, and make sure that everyone can see that. Uh, hopefully you can. Um, first, uh, magandang araw. Uh, in Tagalog, Madigar Ala, uh, in Tagalog, I'm here in Brooklyn, it's snowing heavily. Thank you so much for everyone um, that's come to hear um, my talk. Uh, I particularly wanna thank Anna and, and Kara for inviting me, um, the Graduate Student Committee uh, at Cornell, um, and uh, for uh, the opportunity to kind of revisit something that I've been thinking about uh, for quite a while. Um, I also want to take the time to just mention a, a couple of folks that um, are important to my research. Uh, uh, March is going to be the year-long death anniversary of uh, Miguelito Bancas, one of my most important um, field informants, right? So we will miss him terribly. And um, just the month of January, um, Yabing uh, uh, Masalon Dulo, a Blatan weaver uh, who received um, the uh, National Traditional Artist Prize uh, just passed away. So we're, it's, a, it's a time where lots of important people who have been so helpful to the stuff that we researchers do um, are, are passing on. And I just want to be able to kind of remember them. Um, all right, so, uh, so let me talk about the purpose of my talk, right? So I, I'm assuming, I know that many of you um, in the audience, right, come from many different dif disciplines. And so uh, I wanted to introduce to you the kind of stuff I guess that I do have been doing um, and what I'm trying to achieve with this particular talk. So uh, it's to talk about a topic, right? And a method as well as the data that I'm going to present as well as the, I guess the bridging theory and the point I'm trying to make looping back to it. 
So the topic generally, I guess, would be indigenous peoples in Southeast Asia, which is very, very broad, but my focus would be the material culture that's organized around the making and use of cloth, right? So the cloth that they would make. And so because of that, I look at that kind of literature all over Southeast Asia, right? Not just limited to the Philippines. And the methodology that I have been employing um, since the 1990s would be uh, ethnography, which is ethnographic field research, anthropological field research, um, and um, the use of museum collections specifically colonial era museum collections with a focus on provenance, solid provenance, right? So um, I have to kind of assess the collection before I can make use of it as essentially as a data set. But the important thing about this method too is that it's not just looking at museum collections as some kind of a library for my own research, but actually being able to use some of those materials for elicitations in the field, right? So it's like a the arrow is there because it's a, a relationship between ethnographic field work and the museum collections that are kind of like going back and forth. So I actually have had conversations in the field using photographs from collections and, you know, uh, and they actually in turn uh, allow me to look at the collections right in a different light. So the group of people I work with, as Kara mentioned, would be a uh, people who are referred to as the, the, the Bagobo indigenous peoples of Southern Mindanao. Um, there's a whole different discussion I can have about what this means to be Bagobo, because as a Bagobo um, identity, it's actually not a linguistic identity. There's actually three Bagobo subgroups by linguistic, um, uh, you might say, grouping. My work has been among the Tagabao Bagobo, because anybody who has done fieldwork, you know that essentially you can't do it abstractly. You basically have to decide what field language it's going to be. And so in my case, it was Tagabao Bagobo. And in the process of doing that, I learned right, the, how different um, Obo Bagobo and Jangan Bagobo um, are. So the, um, I guess this would be more like uh, what I'm reaching for, what, what I'm trying to do. My strategy is essentially to, to look at a phenomenological perspective, right? So the, uh, the viewpoint, how um, this entire social processes organized around the making and use of cloth, right? It's actually viewed um, from the perspective of the people that make them, that um, wear them, that collect them, that inherit them, that think about them. So it's this so-called, I guess, indigenous perspective. Um, and it's informed, of course, by this whole notion of trying to fill in our notion of history from those who are underrepresented through this uh, process, right? And I put in there that part of it is also to, to build like a bridging theory. It might be a bit of a conceit, but I like to call it the textile record, textile record for lack of a better term, right? To think about textiles and textile research um, as, as, a, as a body of, of information that's organized and can be drawn on for generating other future questions. So for today, the data set, I guess, out of all of the things that I've been doing for all these years, I'm focusing, the ones I'll present to you would be what I have concerning red cloth, right, within the indigenous textile hierarchy, and how that can be used to look at something else, which would be red cloth on indigenous bodies um, uh, in, in uh, Philippine colonial history. So, so I'm looking at red cloth also beyond, right, indigenous peoples, uh, beyond Bagobo, beyond Mindanao. So it's this kind of, uh, so, so this is the part that's, that's, I would love to hear some feedback on to what you guys think of it, right? But, but this, how insights from my work on the Bagobo can be used to look at red cloth, right? Um, that is used more widely in, in this kind of history of colonial struggle. Um, so, all right. Uh, it's a multi-phase work. Uh, so in, it, at this point, I just wanted to give a shout out to Nina Capistrano Baker, who organized a panel um, at the Berlin uh, Euro Seas in 2019, wherein uh, the first version of this was, was presented. And at that panel, I met Kaya McGowan of Cornell, um, of the Department of uh, History of Art. Um, who invited me for to to the Cornell Humanity Society fabrication um, seminar, which got canceled because of COVID. But but that invitation at least at least triggered right a, a different set of of thinking about this. 
I also want to thank um, Patricia Araneta and RJ Fernandez who were working on a book on the Mercedes Sobel collection that's being donated to Ayala Museum because I was able to again write a small chapter coming out of this whole discussion and thinking about red cloth. But essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, I guess, take ethnographic insights as my core data set and see how that can be applied right, to a broader interdisciplinary, uh, partly historical, material cultural um, problem. All right, so here's the outline of my talk. So the first bunch would be talking about red cloth on indigenous bodies in Philippine colonial history. Then I will segue into red cloth within the Bagobo textile hierarchy. And then I'll give some observations, um, what I think are significant and some of the new data that I think I would need. I would love other people to help me find, collaborate. So those are kind of like uh, how it's going to flow. So, so the bloody reds in the title of the talk is up there in the first one, right? So the whole notion of bloody red. So I'm going to be looking at um, red cloth as it's talked about, understood, imagined, um, uh, implemented, I guess, uh, and some of the actual examples of them um, informed by what I've learned in the field. Uh, okay, so, so here's a, an image that would be very familiar to many um, Filipino art historians uh, and to many Filipinos who would visit um, the National Museum, right? It's this image of, of by Botong Francisco um, of a very large mural that's now in the National Museum of Manila uh, that shows Andres Bonifacio, right? In, a, in a, this heroic diagonal stance with, with the, at behind him, right? The great big flag of the Katipunan. So um, this is kind of like a very powerful image uh, how we imagine how the revolutionary movement, right? Against Spain um, would be visualized right, by, by Botong Francisco. But I wanted to just begin with this because it, it, it shows a flag, but I won't be talking about this depictions of a flag, but, but the depictions of the flag is a very important part of how we understand um, red flags, right? So I want to instead approach um, red flags as flags themselves, right? So, so the thing themselves. So not depictions of the flag, but if I would look at the flag, I would actually want to have the actual flag and look at it right? and, and, and understand all kinds of things about it. So, I have here um, on the right hand side, right, uh, a report in 2018 of, a, of an auction of the flag that pres presumably was gifted by Gregoria de Jesus to Andres Bonifacio that was auctioned in 2018. And so, uh, so that I thought was a very, very important thing because there's a, an actual um, um, thing, right, that's a flag. Of course, now it's entered, of course, the, the collector's uh, realm. So, so th there could be all kinds of other things that could be involved. In. But my question there would be, right, you know, here is a red flag, right? That um, corresponds to the image in the middle. Um, it's a, a selection of historical flags at the Bahay Nakpil, Bautista in Quiapo, Manila. And when I look at that, I would say, well, clearly they're, they're uh, reproductions for, right? Uh, museum education, it's part of the display. I would still wanna know, right? Okay, what did they, what, what, how did they make it? How was it sewn? What was the flaw? So this is kind of me thinking about how I would approach something like a flag but um, and on the left you have an image there that I take many of you might have seen this this is from uh, uh, Rafael Eletos um, Fashion and Revolution which doesn't show a flag per se but it shows right this image of, of the sun Liwana which is a uh, certainly taken from from flag imagery uh, so so flags would be textiles there would be red textiles but I also want to point out that flags are um, certainly uh, not worn on the body right so so I would think of them as, as uh, unworn, right? So cloth that will be approached as, as items that are unworn. So in, in Philippine textile studies, I, I always want to make a distinction between stuff that are worn and unworn. So flags, flats, blankets, right? Um, tend to have more of a social purpose. Uh, they tend to be public. And so I think that categorically from an analytical perspective, they should thought, be thought about that way, right? As, as, as distinct, um, from clothes, right? So, so, so here would be um, red cloth worn on or against the body, right? So, so on the left, another image from Ileto's book, right? The Makario Sakai's Anting Anting shirt. Um, and in the middle, you have a letter to the editor in the Army Navy Journal um, that, that talks about uh, this, this 
horrible bunch of insurgents called the Pulahan, right? <laughs> uh, this is the Philippine American War, right? And then on the right, I have uh, some images that, that, that I got from, um, that were from an exhibition at the Musee Kebron Lee, uh, Yak Shirak, uh, that shows a bunch of, of these so-called kind of anting anting shirts. So there's a whole literature on anting anting, which I'm not gonna be able to get into um, today, but I just wanted to point out that this would be like clothes that are worn, right? And it's interesting because there, there's not a lot of red there, um, especially if you see it in the image on the right, mostly white. And I think it's because it's also inside. It's not, right, it's not public, it's inside. It's also because I'm part of my suggestion is that it's hard to get red cloth. So, so there's the, that, the whole kind of practical as well as kind of semiotic dimension there. Uh, so what we see is mostly right because the writing is important for for these types. But the, but I suggest that redness is still very much implied, not just because of the whole naming right of of the pulahan itself, but but how it emerges in other contexts right in, in Philippine colonial history when it, when you think about dressed bodies, um, especially in the context of armed struggles right, um, or militant right militias and so on and so forth. Um, and so. Here, I, I again collected some more images. Uh, so on the left, you have a Getty image, right? Pulahan militia members. It's un, uh, you can't get away from them. They are wearing red, right? Uh, but uh, it, it, this is circa 1990s. But on the extreme right, you have a 2016 um, uh, still from, uh, from CNN um, video of, uh, because the Pulahan as, as a term kind of emerges and then sinks and reemerges again. But this particular emergence in 2016, uh, for the entire video, I don't have it here, but uh, it's, it's available online. You actually see very little red worn by anybody, but they self-ascribe as Pulahan. In the middle, it's uh, what I find a very astounding image from the Museo Cotahuato of, of at one of the few times that it's actually have a red cloth with the writings associated with anting and thing, right? But as you can see, it's got a tag. So it's a manufactured garment that with the, right, with the writings put upon it. But for here, I, I just want to show that, you know, redness, it, it can be actual, but it could actually also be lexical, right? It's like this self-referencing redness without necessarily wearing red, right? So, so the pulahan who don't wear pula, right? Pula being um, um, red. Um, so so the, the whole notion of redness is actually, and red cloth and bloody reds is, is also very much a part of, of the, dis, the discussion of Bagobo textiles, especially the notion of a Bagobo body as a warrior, right? Um, so that's how Faye Cooper Cole, for example, refers to it. And he, Faye Cooper Cole uh, was uh, one of the, uh, what came to the Philippines in the early 19th century, early 20th century uh, as part of the Cummings ex expedition sent out of the Field Museum. And he wrote a very influential work about right, his, his uh, survey essentially of Mindanao peoples, including uh, the Bagobo and the Bagobo warrior kind of clothing, right? So, but I put it up here because here you have uh, on the left image, courtesy of Mike Price, right, of uh, Bagobo photograph alongside American soldiers at the Jamestown Exposition in Virginia. And on the right, you, I found this um, image online um, of, uh, of the a papa, a Pulahan leader in Samar Leyte, um, where you have red garb bodies in this more kind of, uh, you might say positive framing of a warrior. And you have this not red, but you know, an arrest, a person arrested by military officials uh, of a Pulahan leader, not wearing red, right? <laughs> but but uh, Pulahan itself as, as a kind of, this, this lexical as well as semantic kind of category, right, of, of insurgent, right? So I thought that these kinds of, uh, you know, divergences of what bloody red might mean is, is interesting. Um, so for sure to think about red wouldn't just be within textile. So, so if you think about red as a, as a concept, as a category, there, there's, there's, a, there's a whole, um, set of other possible ways of, of approaching it. I mentioned here, for example, uh, Prospero Kovar talking about uh, the hibiscus, the red hibiscus, right? Gumamela gumame chelis. And uh, Potet's assumption that 
or, or suggestion that, that the, the European concept of the rose is actually the hibiscus, right? So this whole this notion of, of, of redness in, in, in flowers, right? And the significance of flowers and how they can encompass or encapsulate strong emotions such as Michel Rosaldo's work on the Ilong or on fire tree flowers, right? As expressive of, of the young men when they hunt heads, right? Um, or uh, Filomeno Aguilar's discussion of, of pula, fighting cocks, right? Uh, I suppose to put the right, white, so the fighting cocks. So there's a whole lot of whole discussion there. But so, so, so for me, I'm trying to kind of limit it right to, to this notion of bloody reds as expressed or understood um, as, as essentially implemented, right? Engineered, created in an actual thing, which would be a cloth, right? Whether it's worn or unworn. So this, this whole kind of, um, uh, unworn textiles, right, such as flags, which I, we just saw, or I saw, showed you earlier, the worn um, textiles, and then textiles with, that are not necessarily worn, but there's some kind of lexical reference, right, so, so that you call yourself pulahan, for example, um, the red wearing ones or the red bearing ones um, that might persist beyond the actual red cloth itself. So, so for me, bloody reds would be that it has to be based on some cloth, right? And the spiritual practice uh, in armed conflict that, that relies somehow on the use of cloth. Now, the important thing to, to note is that uh, for colonial era, bloody reds, they would be cotton. And this is important. Um, um, and how cotton um, can be dyed red. And whether the cottons are local cotton or whether they are cotton that's imported, uh, let's say from from China, because there's been a great deal of, of cotton uh, cloth coming in from China for several centuries, uh, as well as of course uh, the ones that would come in at the time of the Spanish colonial um, era. I am not a cotton person, so I can actually say that, but I rely on the work of my colleagues who work on cotton, right? And how and it's you'll see how important that would be in terms of thinking about. Uh, red, right? How you would dye cloth red. So, um, but then I'm always going to be looking at, at this, this the, the thingness of things. So, so, so cloth itself, right? Turning cloth red. So uh, in 2019, when, when this paper first came up, it was during the time when uh, I was intellectually exhausted and <laughs> there was a lot of fake news going around. <laughs> and there was this kind of like, sense of uh, utter despair about what one can actually do right, in, in this kind of env environment of, of, you know, of, of skepticism. And so I said, well, let me retreat into what I call the thingness of things. Let's look at cloth right, as a thing. Right? So, so I'm informed here by, by Gell's methodological philistinism, uh, for those of you that know uh, Alpha Gell's work. I'm also in, in, informed by Roland Barthes' notion of bourgeois ex nomination. So, so this is kind of skepticism and despair that kind of makes me look at the thingness of things. So as I look at all these bloody reds, the flags, the, the anting anting, the, right, all of those things, I always would ask myself, well, where the heck did they get the cloth, right? How did they get it red? Do they get it white and dye it red, right? Where, where did you come from? How do you make a flag? How do you make these things? So, so the thingness of things was kind of driving um, this inquiry. Uh, as a response, right? It's like, you know, let, let me escape to uh, empiricism, <laughs> shall we say, <laughs> or uh, uh, physical properties of stuff, right? Try to answer questions, right? As, as, a, as a position, right? So, so, okay. So let me now go to red cloth in terms of how I understand it from my research, right, among the Bogobo and other groups in Mindanao. So I call it the, the textile hierarchy. So it's the, Mindan uh, the Mindanao textile hierarchy. And, and I do that um, because I want to kind of put forward this notion that there is a way by which textiles are understood in Mindanao by Mindanao peoples that are not necessarily understood, right, outside of Mindanao. Uh, outside of, of the communities that don't participate in the making and use of, of this cloth. So I have here an image uh, of, of a Bagobo woman's upper garment, an right, with the medicinal tassel, uh, which is unusual, but 
I thought it was just a lovely garment. And I'm using this because uh, this is one way by which I understand um, red cloth, which is of course through the color red. And so in this particular case, I would call it the first in the textile hierarchy, which is the hierarchy of color. So for Mindanao, and this is not limited to Bagobo, this is all over Mindanao where they use abaca, right? And dye it and use it for garments as well as for flats. Um, red is derived from uh, Morinda, citrifolia. You see it on the upper right. And it's pointing to the body of, of this garment. And black is derived from the leaves of the Ospiros nitida. You see it on the bottom right and it points to the sleeves, right? So this is the kind of black, which is kind of like a dark brown and red, which is kind of like a claret wine colored red. But the fiber is abaca, right? So this is Musa textilis. And so um, be, focusing on this reality, right? Uh, of, of dyeing white, off-white colored thread and cloth to turn it into this deep red or deep black um, it's a process. It's a process that requires all kinds of labor sharing arrangements. It's a process that requires knowledge of plant use. It's a process that, um, right, uh, it's essentially supported, right, by, by a kind of an epistemology, right, or, or, you know, a knowledge system, shall we say, right, of, of how to produce it. So it's a chemical process, right? Um, and, uh, but what's important for the Mindanao textile hierarchy, wherever you are beyond the Bagobo, it's also valid, right? That red is so much harder to achieve than black, right? So it's, a, it's, it's significantly harder to be a successful dyer of red um, than black. And so, so, it, so there's a color, the first hierarchy is color and all across Mindanao that produce abaca cloth, whether or not there's ikat, right? Red is above um, black. So that's the first one. So it's a semantic category, right, of, of color itself, uh, where there, it's a prestige category of garments as well as a category of cloth and color. Right? So, so being able to dye red um, is, is, a, is a marker of, I guess, uh, uh, it's like a PhD, shall we say, right? Uh, it, it's a marker of a series of, of, of kind of like uh, knowledge acquisition and, and, and like performance of, of, of proficiency and presses practice and leading to prestige, right? So that's the first one. So it's important to find out that the color hierarchy, right? The textile hierarchy is not just Bagobo, but it's all over um, in the now that produce abaca cloth. And I posit, I hypothesize, right? Because abaca as a cloth was wide, is, is widespread all over the Philippines, not just Mindanao. Um, we just don't find a lot of abaca. I don't find any actually of, of uh, red or black abaca cloth production in other parts of the Philippines today, but it could have been much more widespread. However, what we have in Luzon and mostly Luzon, right, is, is really more cotton than abaca that's been dyed. So, so it's a whole different conversation as far as concerned, but I'm talking about Mindanao here. Okay, so uh, I call it the second textile hierarchy, right? So it, it would be sheen, right? Shininess. So in Mindanao, uh, again, not limited to Bagobo, right? So red cloth is also considered to be beautiful cloth because it's shiny, right? It's polished. So the sheen itself is what allows, what what's makes it finish. So, so especially for the Bagobo, if a cloth is complete, but it hasn't been polished, it's not finished. It's not done. It's not, it cannot be worn, right? It cannot leave your hands. It cannot, it, it's not done. It, it's unfinished. So, so, um, so it's a sensory dimension, right? Uh, it's it's uh, found um, not just among the Bagobo, but uh, all the groups, um, the Blaan and the Tiboli, uh, for example, polish their cloth and require this sheen. Although I would say that the Bagobo and the Blaan are the most kind of vigorous in the polishing process. They really kind of take the polishing very seriously, right? Um, but it's shared across groups. So Blaan, Tiboli, polish, but not the Mandaya. So, this is, I feel this is significant. Um, I thank Roy Hamilton, uh, who I work with at Fowler Museum, who is an expert in Indonesian textiles in, in Eastern Indonesia, who's kind of um, right, pointed out to me this, this existence of style subsets, right, amongst the Abaha producers, right, in, in now. So it's not, it's, so the sheen itself is, is the, so this is like a dimension that's not 
necessarily cloth, but added to the cloth, but it's inherent in the cloth. So, so what I have here are images taken from the field because part of my field work was also basically photographing collections of textiles in Bagob families. So you have here the late Tuling Ayo Bangkas with a, with a skirt, she's holding up a, this tube skirt, right? So it's all red um, and you can see the sheen um, of it. Um, Linombos is a category that refers to a fully red skirt. So no ikat, but it's just all red. But lombos as a term refers to some kind of erasure, which I think is interesting. And then on the upper right, you have a detail of a, of a mother piece uh, that's rendered in red morinda and the yellowish white would be the natural color of avocado. You can also see the sheen in, in that image. This is from the UPenn collection. Um, and at the bottom right, uh, you see that big red, red patch of shiny cloth. That's actually a repair called the tapong, right? Um, on uh, a larger three panel skirt. But it's interesting that even patch itself is also kind of polished, right? So, so sheen, right? It's, it's a very, it's one of the things that, that is a part of, like, I would say the second textile hierarchy, right? Shiny or not, right? Um, and then the third textile hierarchy, which, which uh, it's important. Um, and this I say is now Bagobo, not Mindana, um, Mindanao wide, right? Because the Bagobo have this, right? Would be uh, ikat cloth that's actually expressed as garments, right? So it's in terms of pattern or cut. So on the left hand side, I have an image there of a three panel cloth um, at the Smithsonian Metcalf collection. Um, and you, it's not very visible, so I'm trying to make it a little bit more visible. So uh, that, that single piece in the middle, that's actually a separate um, panel that's woven separately and it's called the mother piece, the ina, the ina. And the surmounting pieces on either child, uh, other side is, are called the child pieces. So the Bagobo have this structure of, of a mother child um, piece. And this kind of three panel cloth is of course very high in the textile hierarchy for women's garments. And it's called, um, skirts are called sonod, but the three panel one is called ginayan, right? Because you insert the, the ina, the mother in the middle. So it's, it's been mothered, right, the ginayan. And on the center image you see here, um, that is uh, the late Mrs. Apa. And at the bottom would be a piece from her collection, right? Her own family collection. This is taken in Davao, this story, 1993, right? Which, which shows like a similar kind of three panel um, skirt that's really kind of like a family heirloom, right? Um, but here you see the mother piece in Mrs. Appa's uh, skirt rendered in black and white, which is the other color, right? The, 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 the uh, Diospiros or Kinarem, as opposed to the red and white, which is on the example you have on the left. So, so for the third text, the hierarchy, right, would be to think about garments, right, and how garments are cut. And so the cut, the possibility of even creating one, the pattern in the cut of the garment, right, helps um, one who is participating in this cloth making and cloth using, right, material culture, uh, 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 you might say, uh, semantic practices as well as uh, production practices to map this right as, as a as a high ranking cloth and to be able to make such a cloth right would then reflect upon you uh your ability as a as a very senior weaver so so here um i wanted to kind of uh produce in graphic form i guess in in, in not visual but textual form the set of ideas that are important, and I call it a task hierarchy, right? So it means uh, how, how do people who create cloth using abaca and dyeing them red and black, right, with Morinda and Diospiros, um, how do they think about the whole process of, of cloth making, right? So um, the arrow on the left shows uh, the the progression from least to most difficult. So the bottom is the one that has the highest skill level. Um, this task hierarchy is again Mindanao wide, but I'm using Bagobo terminology in parentheses. So 
weaving itself is a very low skill um, task. New weavers, weavers in training, they can be taught to weave, uh, so gabal, right? And although that task itself takes a long time, two to four months continuous work, but it's not considered a big deal, right? Um, being able to tie designs on the ikat frame, right? But but in, in Tagabao or Bagobo, uh, is a medium to high skill level. So you need training, you need to learn how to do this properly. And it could be a whole month uh, per loom length of continuous work, right? So it's a lot less time per se, if you think about just weaving a whole cloth per se, but it's considered to be, right? Next stage. And then the third would be dyeing, right? So dyeing anything is of, of high skill. And, um, but I do know from a couple of instances in the field that if you're gonna start to learn how to dye or you're gonna be invited to learn how to dye, then you begin with black, right? So dyeing or liba is done with, with black or metum. It's high skill um, or higher than all the others. And that itself could take three to four days of continuous work, right? Um, because it's actually not gonna take as long as the last one, which is dyeing with red, to, which is maloto in, in Tagabao Bagobo. So it's very high skill, whether you're dyeing for ikata hanks or solid cloth, right? It, it's 14 days continuous work. What's interesting though, is that the duration doesn't necessarily map onto, um, um, right? In other words, well, the way we think about labor is we think about labor in terms of right, human hours. The human hours map onto it to a certain extent, but not really, right? So, so, so the most amount of time which we'll be weaving is actually considered low to low skill, right? Um, although in the case of of, of dyeing with morinda red, um, the labo the labo the lab <clears throat> laboriousness of it, right, the, the effort that it takes, as well as the knowledge, right. So knowledge and effort um, uh, does map map onto this kind of like greater prestige or greater skill. But it's not necessarily the number of amount of time, but it's really the skill, right. So so it's a the skill level is more relevant. So, so this task hierarchy in making cloth, and I was submit to you making red cloth, right? Is something that I think um, is some, something that we have to keep in mind in, in terms of usage of cloth or cloth making um, as projected back in time, right? Um, colonial period or even uh, uh, a little bit farther than that, um, if possible, we'll see. Uh, so, Dyeing a baka cloth red, right? If using more in the citrifolia, it's it's a fraught process, right? It, mordants, immersion, boiling, post dye additives, so on and so forth. And so that's um, quite clear. And this is something that's actually also found um, in other parts. Uh, it's consistent with the literature in in Southeast Asia. There's a little bit of tweaks here and there, like for example, uh, Janet Hoskins' work would look at blue, right? Uh, indigo. As, as the, the high school. So it maps differently, partly because in so the rest of Southeast Asia, in most cases, it's in cotton, right? So, so they use cotton. So, and they don't use uh, Diospirus that they use indigo. So if, if it was indigo, it's, this is not indigo. There's no indigo here, right? So, so if indigo is put into place, the, the, the Sumba, uh, Sumbawa um, literature she seems to suggest that blue is the high status, right? Color, which is blue turning black. Same thing with Trout de Gavin's work among the Iban, right? It's, it's blue, black. So, but the point I'm making here is that for Abaka, right? And Morinda, red's the hard color and black's the easy one. So that's kind of um, what I need to point out here. And I need to kind of think about as, as we move forward to the other stuff. Okay, so um, in the early 20th century, however, um, it is such a fraught process, so much so that Laura Watson Benedict reported that young Bagoba women don't want to be bothered with making red cloth and black cloth and would instead use uh, shop bought cotton. So these are two pieces from the Metcalf collection at the University of Pennsylvania, wherein, um, and it's interesting, right? It, the transposition of the red body and the black sleeves and the top right garment and the red sleeves and the dark blue body on the in the bottom garment, right? That, that transposition um, um, is, is interesting. But but this one, it's it's a 
this was possible because of this desire for labor saving as reported by Benedict. But I also suggest that it is also possible because of the existence right, of access to cash, right? cash economy, because shop bought cotton means that you have to buy it, right? That young Bagobo women would have access to, which is probably uh, made possible right, by a Baka plantation economy um, that was already um, uh, you know, starting out uh, uh, as early as, as the 1900s, uh, early 1900s in, in Mindanao. Um, but what I also want to point out here is that the dimension of, of the notion of fashion, right? So young people preferring this as opposed to old people preferring that. Um, and also the semiotic question, you know, why, why blue, why not black, right? So, so there might be some kind of loop back to indigo there um, that could be pursued. But, but substitution was, was already happening, right? Um, more than a hundred years ago. And, uh, but it's happening in this kind of pattern way, right? The, the logic here would be the logic of the cut of the garment um, itself. So among bloody, going back to bloody reds, uh, it would be Bagobo men, right? Who, who think about bloody reds. So uh, they would not be wearing bloody red, <laughs> except because of red, its scarcity, except in the cases of, of wearing red, uh, usually in the headscarves, um, which is a kind of a marker for ch chiefly status or warrior status. Uh, but here, the ritual practices I want to show you are like twofold, right? So the, in the armed conflict context, which in this case, um, was in an altar post, which is used uh, for ritual invocations of the Bagobo Bolo Brigade militia. In, um, sorry, that year got removed. It's 1997, this photo was taken. Where you have in the photo, you see a bit of commercial red cotton cloth, a, a bit of white, and there's black in there. You just can't see it. But these are the three colors, right? Consistent right, with Morinda red, right? And it, the spiritity, the black, and then of course the whiteness of the abaca, right? I'm doing a little bit of Victor Turner here, right? The red, white, and black um, thing that you see there, but they 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 emerge just like like little remnants, right? And this is kind of like ritual altar post. And on the right, I have a screen grab here from a public Facebook post by a Jang and Plata uh, family in Kalinan, um, where you see right a great deal of variety of of reds. Right, a red T-shirt. Right, a uh, red um, a magindanao um, a headcloth, a tubao. Right, and then this red garment that's made as a jacket worn by the ritual officiant. And then it's not very clear here, but the the red and white um, tangkulo. Right, the headcloth. Right, that's uh, uh, using commercial cotton, but dyed um, and patterned by hand. Right, so so you have here right a uh, redness kind of still permeating and, and being expressed right, in, in, in kind of very specific pattern ways. Still associated with the notion of efficacy, I would, I would argue, right? Uh, but again, um, other things that are not explicitly what I want to point out, right, would be, again, the ability to purchase red cloth. So in 1990s to the present, it's not too difficult to buy red cloth anymore. Um, but it is very, very expensive to buy thread. Hence, abaka as a thread is still the thread of choice because you don't have to buy it. Uh, the purchase of, of thread that's suitable for the backstrap loom um, occurred a couple of times. I observed it in the collections of uh, Jang and Bagobo families, but they told me that for those cases, the weaver will negotiate that you buy the thread yourself because it's such a huge, um, cash outlay, and they buy this thread called DNC, and they buy it from um, this this store in Davao City, and uh, for it to be enough for for a cloth, right? So so they like the stability and the beauty of it, but it's very very expensive. So so cash right behaves differently here, where buying red cloth is cheaper than trying to commission cloth made out of cotton thread. Instead, a baka thread is this kind of factor that allows Bagobo weavers to continue to be creative, right? It gives them that that that, that, that the raw materials and the space, right? To think about red, right, right? In that way, alongside this type of, of kind of commercial cotton use. But you can see, right, the, the how redness 
here, in this case, it's in a context of peace, right? So this is a family gathering um, in, the, in the backyard around uh, the family um, altar that is actually a plabak, right? A indigenous uh, uh, kind of altar post that's attached to uh, these cordelin terminalist uh, trees that you can also find in, in the Pacific. But anyway, so, all right. My observances, my, my observations, okay, and, and what I think would be the significance. So, so um, when I first presented this paper, uh, Mark Johnson was our uh, discussant in, in Berlin, and I thank him for pointing out that he says that I'm doing something that is actually speculative, but he meant it in a positive way. <laughs> and so I, I take that positivity, right, and, and, and just point out that this is what I'm trying to do. So I'm looking at red cloth and spiritual practices in armed conflict, right, in colonial context, right, uh, perhaps reliably, right, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. So Spanish as well as American. Um, and then I'm connecting. Um, have a lot of information on, which is how to successfully produce a red cloth. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, I'm being told that my internet is unstable. So if for some reason something happens, please um, let me know. Um, but that signal has gone away. All right. So, so bridging this idea of red cloths and spiritual practices and armed conflict, right, and how to successfully produce red So it's quite a, quite a big jump, right, quite a big jump. So, so how, how, how do I propose to kind of fill that gap or how to kind of put stuff there to kind of bridge that argument? So uh, in response to Martin Johnson, right, I call it my Morinda hypothesis, right? So, so uh, it's not blood, but sweat. <laughs> so I'm kind of inserting here, I guess, the, the, the knowledge system generated by Mindanao women, right? Who look at cloth and who make the cloth are responsible for producing the cloth, right? And uh, have a, a sense, right? Have this hierarchy that's informed by the makers of cloth, but also the users, but the makers of cloth, right? Uh, to, to kind of put red cloth as, as really up there, right? Um, and it's because of, of the laboriousness, right? And the technical, Know how, and I guess you might even say the the uncertainty, right, of, of making sure that dyed red cloth or dyed red thread holds its color, right? You want because it's it's never a guarantee, so it's it's really about you being able to to achieve that, right? So it's kind of like a, this this gap, right, um, where I have a bunch of ideas and I have a bunch of information, right. Um, that I seek to fill. So, so I wanna think of red cloth, not just as an artifact, as a thing, although that's how I began, the thingness of things, right? But certainly as an artifact, as an idea, right? This red cloth, right? Tied to cloth making knowledge. Um, in this case, Morinda. And, 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 I, and I, I put in Morinda, even though Morinda doesn't seem to appear as, as readily, right? In the literature, um, it appears, but not as readily in the literature on cottons in the rest of the Philippines, especially in Luzon and the Visayas. But Morinda on cotton is all over Indonesia, right? All over um, Eastern Indonesia, Kalimantan, Borneo, Sulawesi, right? Flores, I mean, all over Indonesia as well as Malaysia, right? Um, so, so Morinda on red is, is not a far stretch. It's also on the mainland, uh, Southeast Asian mainland. Right? Um, so I also kind of reach for this notion of of right of, of the the thing, the the red cloth, right, as as having a physical existence, as well as what Michael Chasen calls right a status, right, where where he defines artifact as a as a status, not just the thing itself, but it's a status that objects hold. Um, due to their relationship with people, right? So, so, so in that case, it's the making of red cloth itself um, and how that essentially shapes the valuation of red cloth. So um, what can we learn about the kinds of interactions, right? That, 
that red cloth itself participate in. So I'm using here Gell's notion of, of agency of things, right? So the things themselves uh, participate, right, in, in, in social um, in social processes, including right armed conflict and signaling, as well as managing spiritual kind of forces in order to uh, guarantee one's survival, right? Uh, all of those things are certainly part of the interactions that red cloth were participating. So, so, so to be able to do that filling in, right? That, that there's data that that's certainly kind of more data that's needed. So here I think about more in the hypothesis. This is not something that can be done in one field. It's certainly interdisciplinary. Having been mired in COVID as we all have since uh, January, 2020 pretty much, um, uh, has also kind of shifted the things that I'm able to do and have been unable to do. I have not been able to, as many of you probably have this situation, this very little new data that I can get by going to museums. There are no museums to go to. The, the, I mean, it's very limited. Uh, even people I collaborate with in the Philippines right, have, don't always have access because of the lockdown there. Um, and so I've been going back and reading a lot of historical sources. So Hayasi's work, Shinzo Hayasi's work on genealogies, Magobo genealogy is very interesting to me. Um, Rereading Norman Owen's work on Abaka in Bicol, right? So, so there to help me think about right Abaka uh, outside of, of Mindanao for sure, but also Abaka as, as you know as an industrial fiber. The work of Sandy Castro uh, in her fabulous book um, on um, textile terminologies and what she's been able to present and find in museum and archival collections uh, in Spain, right? Um, has been a real um, eye opener, um, especially when I'm thinking about cotton, right? Uh, cotton, red cotton, or any other kind of color of cotton, right? Um, archaeological techniques, uh, the work of Judith Cameron on um, Vietnamese um, uh, braille cloths uh, and the kinds of, I, I, I would like, I was hoping to do more on non destructive techniques. But again, and then this is probably what I'm hoping to kind of throw out to everyone. There's a lot of non-traditional textile sources out there. And so this is the most recent one. And, and I'm actually going to end um, with this. Uh, uh, Ricky Jose, Regalado Trota Jose, he's the archivist at the University of Santo Tomas, who's a very old friend. And one of those folks who will just have always something interesting to say whenever I share with him anything. And so he says he couldn't, attend this talk today, but instead he sent me an email on a work he just recently finished. He says, and I'm going to read from his email, right? He says, I'm attaching my day old article that I'm writing for Nita Churchill. He says, on Juana Manahin, a Tagala who made her will in 1691. In clause 143, this is a multi-page will that Juana Manahin wrote. Um, she mentions a red tapis. A tapis is like a Tagalog term for a, a skirt, right? She mentions a red tapis and a red bed cover from Lumbang. So Lumbang was the place of making of these textiles. Colorado was the term for red. Right? He says Colorado, right? Which Spanish means colored, right? Um, but not rojo. So this is very interesting, right? So, so Colorado meant red, which means to color something means that it's actually red. So this is in um, 1691. He continues, I wonder if there is some significance here. Uh, because she had very little else in the way of clothes. So this multi-page will, right, has a lot of stuff that she talks about what she's giving away, but there are only these two pieces of cloth and they're both Colorado, which I find really intriguing. Um, and I think um, fascinating in terms of what uh, that might mean. Uh, so I'm gonna stop right here uh, and just wanna give a shout out, uh, thanking, of course, the graduate student committee for inviting me. My university and my department for giving me a whole year of sabbatical. Um, Bard Graduate Center, which, you know, I joined that community virtually, unfortunately, right? I can't do anything face to face, but that's actually already been very, very interesting. Um, and then the images I've used uh, for this presentation would be uh, to the courtesy of Adria Katz and Carrie Beauchamp and Mike Price, Phil Macau. Bagaho, Bangahas, uh, Bagaho, Bagaho, Bagpayo, Bagaho, Bangkas family and the upper family and double this sort. 
Um, and I will just uh, stop there. So uh, I guess uh, I'm open for questions and comments. Thank you so much, Sherry, for that wonderful presentation. Definitely learned a lot about textile production, which I am very novel to, but it sounds like a wonderful process that requires a lot of skill that I definitely could not do, even though I owned many textiles myself, <laughs> um, not of the highest quality as these, though. So the first um, question I'm going to invite, it was more of a comment that was going around um, during your presentation. It's from Sam, excuse me if I pronounced your last name wrong, Inthali. These garments look similar to the Northern Lao garments. I wonder about their correlation between these two groups of different countries. And then also made a further comment, I think, as you were getting into your findings about the production of red versus the presentation of red. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, when we look at the, how these cloths um, appear, their immediate associations we find, right? So yes, for sure, Northern Lao, um, wherever you have warp ikat cloth, production, which is in all over Southeast Asia. Um, and so the difficulty though, with my thinking about that too broadly would be where it might take me, right? So, so it, if I just think about warp Ika, then it's a very, very large um, uh, swath uh, that goes beyond actually Southeast Asia. Uh, for the specific kind of, if we're thinking about stylistic uh, attributes, then the closest for the Mindanao that I could see outside of the Philippines would actually be Ulap Doyo, which is in uh, Kalimantan, um, in terms of the fact that they use also not cotton, but the same red, uh, black and white uh, warp ikat um, color scheme, as well as of course, uh, what you find all over Eastern Indonesia. Uh, but for mainland Southeast Asia, you see ikat of course, is, is, it goes all to Central Asia as well, right? As, as well as India, right? So it's, it's a whole big, whole discussion. Um, but uh, what I found that's helpful for me to think would be to start with this kind of, you might say, um, uh, inductive, right? <laughs> uh, approaches, uh, presenting um, um, the information about how the cloth is made. Um, and then over time have others such as whoever might be working in, in Northern Lao, um, as well as uh, other parts of, of, of Southeast Asia, to be able to present with comparative information. For example, I would love to know what's used to produce red, right? Of course, people use commercial too, but I would love to know what is considered by the practitioners red to, to produce a good red on, on what would produce a good black, right? So for Northern Lao, it's most likely to be also indigo, I'm guessing, um, uh, but, uh, but yes. I hope that answers the question or comment. Thank you so much. And then we have two comments coming from Amanda Ruff. So I'm wondering if Amanda would like to come forward and ask them herself, or she would prefer me to narrate them from the chat. But also, uh, Professor Kuzan, would you mind stop sharing your screen? So we, yeah, thank you. And uh, Amanda, let us know. Uh, you can drop it in the chat if you want me to start reading your comments or if you just want to unmute yourself and uh, and ask your questions. Well, I guess I will pick them from the chat then. Um, and there were two comments. First was that does red have a temporality or a life cycle? And then the second comment from Amanda was that as the creation, the expression and the wearing of the color red has gendered associations and labor, does the red also have cosmological spiritual associations in your research? Thank you. So uh, for the first great questions, I love that question, you know, temporality, life, does it have a life cycle? So I'm gonna approach it from the methodological philistinism, right? So, so let's approach that first in terms of like, is there a particular time of the year when they would be able to die with red? Uh, the answer would be no, right? But it would be inserted within the agricultural um, um, calendar, of course. But because of the way by which one can actually even produce red, then it's actually more like an end of life life cycle. So, so for, for makers of red, it's like a, a late life um, uh, process, right? Um, 
does the color itself have a life cycle? Now, I don't know how to interpret that if, if you mean um, that it, it's, uh, you know, uh, its usage, right, over time. Um, for sure, because it is a, um, the high category of, of garment and cloth, um, and it's very hard to get, then it tends to be something that persists over an individual's life. It's, tends to be the one that's passed down, right? It's, it's very likely to be something that is passed down. I don't know if that's what that question um, um, alludes to. What was the second question again? I'm sorry. Um, uh, yeah, let me read it out from the chat again. Okay, uh, as the creation, expression, and wearing of the color red has gendered associations um, and uh, gendered associations in labor, does the red also have cosmological, spiritual associations in your research? Um, for the Bagobo, what's interesting when I look at uh, Bagobo mythology, right, and Bagobo, um, uh, uh, they call it Ituran, right, the stories right, that, that, they, that they relate, right, um, redness tends to be associated with a garment, so this is a certain kind of thing about red as an idea expressed really in, in textile form, so um, in which case both men and women wear red. But mostly, right, elder women, right, uh, would wear certain types of red more than others. So there's that kind of uh, gender, uh, uh, gendered expression that occurs. However, there's a category of cloth that is associated with, with chiefs, right, warriors and chiefs um, that are patterned, that also are women who belong to the family of such chiefs could wear. So it's got that kind of gender, but also status thing, which is pretty much all, all over the literature. Um, but for sure, the way they talk about it or understand it, right, it, it tends to be for some reason, or maybe because of my own interest, right, this is the kind of stuff that I have my ears out for, they tend to always be expressed right in the metaphor of cloth, right, cloth making, um, the dressed body, right, the dress, dressed body resplendent, right, so it's this kind of like, it's always uh, uh, coming out, right? The, the dress body, the, her body, right? Uh, her hair that's like ikated thread, right? Uh, so long that it's carried aloft by bamboo and her again, dress body. So, so it's always kind of expressing the metaphor of, 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 of cloth. I hope that answers that question. Thank you for that. So Elena, I saw that you have turned on your video. Would you like to ask your question in person or live, sorry? Okay, I will ask it then. Let me just go back to it. So thank you for the interesting talk regarding red cotton cloth. Historically, there is a huge body of literature about red dyeing in Indi India, the so-called turkey red, and another relationship to the red woolen trade cloth brought by the Spanish Portuguese to the region and quantity. Um, first, yes, Morinda all over India, right? And cotton. So, so, so it's, it's uh, Morinda is not just a Southeast Asia. It's, it's certainly something that that's actually very, very widespread. Um, now, I think what the question might be asking is about the, the, right, the importation of, of actual whole cloth um, within the time frame of what I'm examining, which is essentially right, just 1880s onwards, right? There are no reports of Morinda cloth a Morinda dyed red cloth from India uh, by that time. Prior to that, it's quite possible, but I don't have any kind of, you know, uh, uh, archival um, museological um, evidence. There is a great body of evidence for that, right, elsewhere in Southeast Asia. More likely, what the kind of red cloth that is uh, of cloth, whether red or not, right, cotton cloth being imported um, in, in, in Mindanao would have been more likely. Um, produced uh, from China, right? More, more likely because of, of the, the, the prop, uh, uh, closeness to Sulu and Sulu's um, trade um, uh, with China as well as Maguindanao, right? Now, um, cotton production is no longer present when I did my field research um, in the 1990s. Benedict reports uh, cotton uh, weaving among the Bagobo right in the early 20th century. Whether or not that was locally produced, I don't know. There is no evidence in terms of memory. However, um, a dictionary by uh, Matteo Hisbert in 1886 does mention a spindle, right? So, so um, it could be there. However, the 
Indian dimension is very, very big, uh, but specifically for a, a category of cloth that I didn't discuss today, which is the man's head cloth, the tankulu. So if you are familiar with Indian textiles, then there's a whole category that they call the bandana, which is this kind of tie dyed cloth, right? So it's very striking. It's very, very similar to the head cloths uh, that the, the Bagobo um, uh, men still wear. And sometimes you find right in, in female clothing. So that's for the India and Morenda um, part. The other part would be the Portuguese cottons and wool. So that's fascinating because I, I know that when I was in Leiden many years ago, they actually had um, a jacket that was made of red wool that was labeled Bagobo. And I thought, whoa, did they make a mistake, right? Uh, but I believe that uh, textile usage in Southeast Asia, not uh, excluding the Bagobo, right, um, was actually very, um, what is the word for it? It's, it's not, they, they're not judgy. They, they, they take whatever cloth there is, right? And they, they would take it and they would make stuff with it. So th it's a kind of very creative approach to textiles. So I, I know from Sandy Castro's work that the, the Spanish tried to have like a, a, a cotton factory in Manila in the, um, in the um, uh, early uh, 19th century um, that produces red and, and uh, I believe blue cloth for uniforms, right? Um, so as far as that specific thing, Portuguese imports and wool, I don't have that answer, but I would love to be able to find out from someone else if, if, uh, right, if they have something about Portuguese wool that would enter the Philippines at that time. Remember, when you're dealing with Mindanao, especially in the historical period, it's so different from Luzon, right? The, 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 time, the, the, the time frame is so different. For, for sure, there was no great big Spanish, you might say, presence, right? Especially in the areas where the Bagobo were um, until very late, right? So, so not until the latter half of, of, of the 19th century. So I can't tell you a, a bit more. However, I'm hoping with the work of, of new, new scholars, right, especially when you're looking at the kinds of um, uh, imports, right, that would actu actually come in. And for the point of view of the Bogobo, the shop, right, what were shops like? I wish somebody would do that kind of research, right? What were, shop what were shopkeepers selling, right, on the retail level, right, um, and, and what that cloth looks like. So on my end, oh, I couldn't do it during COVID, I, I was, I'm going around, hoping to go around more museums and kind of like, you know, doing more um, it, I, collecting, I, I guess, data on weave structure and all kinds of other things and non-destructive analytical techniques to be able to try to answer that question. Um, but right now, I wouldn't know, but imports itself, as well as the usage of something as unusual, right, as wool, I've actually seen it. Whether that was a Portuguese import, I don't know, but I wouldn't rule it out because it would be red. It's a really, really different kind of red but it would be um, certainly be something that they would consider, right? As part of the possibilities of, of, of the garments that they would wear. Thank you. And the next question is coming from uh, Professor McGovern. Uh, so Professor McGovern, I'm not sure if you want me to read it out or if you want to unmute yourself. You can read it. You go ahead. Okay. Uh, Hi, thanks. Hi, how are you? I love your talk. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Kaya. So let me read out Professor McGovern question. Um, she says, thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, I like your move with Marine Dadai uh, for contemplating not blood, but sweat. You mentioned Jeanette Hoskins uh, and Indigo. She looks at the inward liquids of the dye vat. Have you looked at Rand's Herring's work on dye process and life sequencing in East Java, where she also looks at uh, wetness and the dye vat as associated with the womb? Yes, uh, thank you for that question, um, Kaya. Kaya heard this in the very early right versions of it. So, so um, the not blood, but sweat is like a, a new addition to it. But, but uh, what's interesting is that because of so okay, indigo, right, it has these dye pots, right? So, so indigo dyeing, as far as the literature is concerned in the Philippines, you have a lot of those studies happening in Northern Luzon, especially in Ilocos. So, so Rick, I mentioned Regulado Jose, he has a lot of research on, on Ilocos. Um, and you know, when you're dyeing with indigo, you have this kind of, it's a whole different kind of hardware or infrastructure that you need, which you don't get with Morinda. So with Morinda dyeing, they don't use 
dye pots. They basically use these five gallon biscuit tins. Right? So, so it, it doesn't have that. Yeah, so it's, it's really kind of, uh, so it doesn't have this, this kind of like this, this heft that you would have for, with, with indigo dyeing and the, the great big, you know, uh, kind of indigo um, uh, factory manufacturers in, 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 that you'll find in, in, in Luzon, right? So, so uh, as in that sense, uh, right, it, it, is a, it is a process that requires this notion of wetness, but it doesn't, there, there's no real sweat in terms of like, you know, uh, the, the pottery or the, the vessel that it's actually dyed in because it's, it's basically biscuit tins, right? <laughs> on, on wood fire, but it has to be next to a river, right? Or next to a creek, because then you have to take out and rinse and then put it back in, right? So, so it's a whole kind of process. So, so it, it's a, I guess that's what's also important about it because in this sense, Morinda and Abaka have a whole different set of gestures, you might say, right? It's a bodily right from a perspective like uh, I'm doing a bit of husserl here right so, so the body in space right it's it's a it's not the same set of 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 kind of uh, uh, sources of physical exertion that you would have um, as you would have uh, with indigo but yes but I, I love Renz's work um, and and uh, and I and, and Janet Haas's work but what's what's important for us to, to understand is that even though it's not indigo it's morinda in Mindanao, that same kind of right, task hierarchy that leads to social valuations is in place. So it could be Morinda, it could be Indigo, um, but at the same time, it produces this kind of hierarchy of value that I suggest is based right on this notion of, of, of effort, effort, efficacy, and, and, and knowledge. Thank you. So the next question actually also touches upon the task hierarchy as well. It comes from Alicia or Alicia. I, I'm just going to give a few seconds and I'll probably go and recite it if Alicia or Alicia doesn't choose to, because it seems we have a common thread of no one, no one seems to really want to speak today, but I totally understand that I'm very much like that on Zoom classes. <laughs> Um, so going back to the slide with task hierarchy, we see that the duration of production is much longer for the low medium skill level, such as weaving. It would be interesting to know how the Bogobo might have a preference for the physical representation of the garment, whether it be color design or weaving in terms of time. Hmm. I'm not sure what, uh, let me think, uh, how the Bogobo might have a preference for the physical representation of the garment whether it be in color design or weaving in terms of time. I'm not sure I understand um, the, what the question is. Um, you mean how the task itself, I guess what I could do is I could focus on what they are actually doing now in terms of garment color and design, right? So I didn't mention it in this talk, but for, for when I'm trying to look at the Bagobo textile record, looking at 1880s, right, to 1900s, to what we have in 1990. Um, there's a kind of a bifurcation of, you might say innovation, I could say, or bifurcation of, of uh, yeah, let's go with that bifurcation. So upper garments versus lower garments. So with upper garments, there's a great deal of shift. There's a great deal of change. Uh, so similar to what we saw in the slide where you have upper garments made of shop cotton, right? But still having the same pattern. Um, as, as the traditional, quote unquote, traditional ones. Uh, by the mid 20th century, upper garments are completely just made of, that you would find, right? That Bagobo used were made of cotton. So this will be in the stuff in Bagobo family uh, collections or polyester, right? It, it's, it's like very, very, uh, very, very different by, 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 for sure by the 60s. And then we see that still in the 1990s, right? And up to today, there's actually uh, a, a big shift in even how it how it starts so the sleeves are larger. So, but in general, right, upper garments have, have a, a great deal of innovation, a great deal of shift. Lower garments are very conservative. So this is very interesting for me, right? So, so for lower garments for females, um, and I'm not even talking about males here, they persist in this shape and form. So, so they tend to be an abaka. If you can't find bagobo abaka, then you can get a mandaya tourist cloth, right, and just kind of polish it, right, I've seen that once, right, happening, but, but, but lower garments, especially those skirts, hotsunod, right, are very, very um, conservative, and another thing I didn't talk about today would be the notion of, of completeness, so Ogobo today would not venture out in 
festival wear or ceremonial wear unless it's complete. Completo, they say, right? It has to be completo. So gar upper garment, lower garment, accessories, right? Headgear, right? Uh, you know, there's a whole set of, of, of stuff that need to be worn for you then to be able to come out. So, so that includes, of course, the innovations in the upper garment and the... Now, of course, today, there will be always Bagobo women dress in ceremonial clothing, especially in Davao, because there is a beauty contest, right? This is the Philippines, of course, there are beauty contests, right? So, so you would have the, the Kadayawan festival, right? The city of Davao, where you would have beauty contests from all the different indigenous groups of, of Davao city, right? Representing their culture, right? So, so of course, you know, if you're gonna be a, the, 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 the Bia, right? Uh, representing the, the Bogobo, you have to have a complete attire. And there, that's where you would probably see these expressions and these innovations, right? So lots of stuff happening, but, but in terms of upper garments, right? And then accessories, right? But, but really it would be the, the, the lower garments that, that don't change too much. And so how, what do I make of that? I can only say that right, there are certain decisions that's certainly being made, right? So there's certain kind of ideas that are, that are being um, rejiggered right, by Bagobo practitioners. So, so I'm looking here at the Bagobo today, right, who still right, make use of, 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 of these clothes as ceremonial wear or performance wear, right? I hope that kind of answers that question. Thank you. And then we have um, a short question from Elena Mirana, and it goes as, do you find the term kumintang also associated with red in any of your data? Hi, Lynette. You. Yeah, glad you're able to join us. I know it's really uh, late in Manila. Um, yes, uh, I know of the net's work, right, with, with the Comintang um, in, in Batangas. Um, no, I, I, I thought about it, but I don't find Comintang as a term um, with red. But that doesn't mean it, it doesn't exist. I'm looking only at Tagabao Bagobo um, as, as a, right, in terms of, of the terminology, right? It's Maloto, right? Uh, redness is Maloto. And, uh, and Sandy Castro pointed out that, and I should know because my father's Kapampangan, but I don't speak Kapampangan. It's red also in the Kapampangan language. So Maloto is, is the term uh, for red, so, so not so far. Great, and with that, I think we have our final question of the day, and that is from Ms. Natasha. It goes as some of the acquisition notes on the Faye Cooper Cole collection, I hope I pronounced that right, at the Field Museum, say that for Blan, plain red cloth was appropriate for warriors' trousers, but red cloth with black stripes was not, indicating perhaps higher status for the unpatterned cloth. Is there a hierarchy of types of red of cloth among the Pogobo? Yes, um, there is. Uh, and the Blan material that you mentioned, I actually did also some, some, um, some research with, with Blan communities. So Blan have this um, pinstripes, red cloth with black pinstripes, uh, which they call tinajung which is really for, for trouser cloth. But for the Bagobo, yes, I, I talked about the linonbos, which is this all red right, cloth that has no ikat whatsoever. And you, at first you might think, why is that such a high status one? Because, if, because it doesn't have any ikat, right? From just looking at it from the outside. But, and, but then when you realize how difficult it is to achieve this even red, right? Then you see why the linonbos would be a very, very high um, uh, kind of cloth. The other kinds of red cloth, um, which I didn't show and talk about would be, and it's, I'm glad that you mentioned trousers, right? It would be cloth that tends to be used for men's clothing, which would be checks, right? Checks and plaids. So they have a red and white uh, fine check called ampit or ampik, which I believe, right? is a term that comes also from some Maguindanao uh, plaids as well as from imports from India, right? Uh, so, so you have this kind of, uh, this red plaid that, that is manufactured locally, um, but the ones that I have examined are made of abaca. Benedict, as you know, as I mentioned, I mentions that it's actually also done by them in cotton. Uh, but warrior trouser cloths um, tend to be at the lower rank than, let's say, the all red linombos uh, skirts, right? Uh, warrior, uh, warrior, I wouldn't call it warrior, I would just say that, you know, umpak, but clothing, but umpak, uh, kamama, men's clothing, men's shirts or saro or the trousers, right? Um, in general, for the Bagobo at least, do not tend to use uh, a lot of ikat, right? Very minimal ikat. Uh, the Laura Watson Benedict collection also in Museum of Natural History, as well as the Metcalf collection at UPenn and Smithsonian um, tend to have a lot of, um, apart from the striped 
this this heathered kind of look. So there's no real ikat there, but it's like the striped, this kind of heathered stripe. It almost looks like um, the coloring of native chickens, right? So, so you have this kind of heathered look that are implemented in, in striped form um, in red or uh, variations of red that are again right of, of the lower category. Partly I think it's because men's clothing are almost always, well actually not always, right? Um, uh, made with a lot of additional ornamentation, embroidery, right? Uh, a lot of applique, uh, a lot of beadwork, right? Um, so so it's, it doesn't stand by itself, right? Whereas for uh, the, the three panel uh, ikat uh, of, of the Bagobo, for example, um, the, the kind that you saw with the red, with the beading in the middle, that's kind of new, but but in the early 20th century, right? It's, it's actually the ikat, it's kind of like when you go to a steakhouse, they give you the steak and no sides because the steak it should be enough, <laughs> which is a very odd thing for me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it's kind of like that, the ikat is enough. So you don't need to embellish it with anything else, right? Uh, that's kind of like how, how, how it would look. So, 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 so the, clo the cloth for men, often red, not always red, right? Because sometimes it's black, um, tend to not have that type of, of, uh, of, of patterning and are also assumed to be a little bit um, of a lower hierarchy. However, having said that, abaka cloth is still precious. So the tailoring of men's garments is a very, very kind of um, practical. It's very engineered, right? It's like being in fashion and engineering it so that you have very zero waste of cloth. So the way it's tailored and the way it's made, right? It's, it's, it's engineered in such a way that there's almost zero waste, right? So, so even though it's a low status cloth, it's still precious, right? So, so you need to kind of go with it and, and tailor it carefully. All right, and with that, thank you everyone for your questions. And thank you, Cherry, again for joining us and lecturing us about the fascinating history and use and modern day usage of Bugobo textiles. Oh, I see a question by, from Elena Phipps, uh, maybe. The... Oh, she's just saying, I think she has to leave oh. and best wishes oh, okay. for her. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, never mind. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, it's no problem whatsoever. Yeah. Um, thank you for catching that quicker than I did, actually. Uh, but yes, thank you everyone for joining. And Cherry, thank you for joining us today. Next week, we have a lecture from John Burgess on uh, Encore's modern history through World War II and how it has changed in terms of war and tourist dollars. So I hope you guys can join for that one as well. But other than that, I hope you guys have a great afternoon, great evening, great morning, <laughs> whatever time zone that you're calling from. And if it's uh, you're in Manila, I really hope you're gonna go to sleep after this. <laughs> but uh, have a good day, everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you.